at the beginning of every disaster movie, it starts with people ignoring scientists. I, we laugh when we oh, see God. that. Yeah. I wonder if you laugh when you see that. I stopped participating in like some future projection climate assessment stuff. It just is super bleak. Like you go to these workshops yeah. and you're like, let's put out a new projection for the future. And then like at the bar that evening, like everybody's just like totally depressed and <laughs> nobody wants to like you invite a friend who wasn't at the workshop. They're like, what is wrong with you people? Right. And you're like, oh, we're just looking at climate projections for the day. And well, this is it. There's a lot of hopelessness around it. I think it's easy to feel hopeless. I mean, it's such a big problem that you it, it just invites you to feel hopeless at the individual level. No doubt you've heard about Greenland in the climate change conversation. Mostly it's because of the melting ice sheet and that's impact on global sea level rises. And if you were to come here, you would see lots of markers of the destructive forces that we have unleashed with climate change. So I wanna show you something, crevasses. Crevasses are these big, compelling canyons that have opened up in the ice. And yes, they are beautiful to look at, but here's the thing, scientists say, they think these canyons have opened up in the last 20 years, and they're opening up more than 100 kilometers into the ice sheet. That is a scary headline because it talks about the ice sheet's response to climate change. It's one thing to hear about them, one thing to read about them. I want you to see them. Come with me as we go to the ice sheet. As far away as Greenland might be from you, what's happening here is crucial to your life when it comes to climate change. The ice sheet is in trouble. You hear a lot about it, but what's actually happening? There are only two ice sheets in the world, in the Antarctic and Greenland. The ice sheet contains more than 95% of the fresh water on Earth, and scientists have been keeping an eye out and sounding the warning bell. I have been summoned by not only Greenland's incredible landscapes, but by this fella right here, Canadian scientist Liam Colgan. Hey, how are you? Welcome to Lulusat. Great to be here. Hey buddy, good to see you, man. Liam works for the Geological Survey of Denmark in Greenland, and he wanted to show me what was happening. So three hours on the ground, two and a half hours of flying, probably. The far one is mm -hmm. here, I see. Right. Yeah. That's not the crevasses one, right? That is the crevasses one. That is the crevasses one, one. It's a warm day down here. It's supposed to be minus 20 at the capacity field. Uh, we just load up the vehicle. Now we're going to go to the airport and see how much we weigh. We usually weigh more than we want to. And then the pilot will tell us how far we can fly and what we can do. But we're hoping to get all the way up to two kilometers to see the big crevasses today. Okay, so this will not be as smooth as other people drive this vehicle. When you say other people, you mean me? You drove it pretty smooth, George, I'll give you that. Last time I checked in on these crevasses, there were three open crevasses, but the field keeps getting bigger. So I'm guessing we might see more than three open crevasses this time. We just don't know. perfect weather. I think that's why the pilot's in such a good mood on the phone. If you can see coming off that ridge line ahead of us. Yeah. Yeah, that's the airport. So that's, that's a really short runway. Yeah, but you see they've leveled the hill behind it and it'll soon be twice as big. Good morning, Adam. We are, as you may hear, at the airport. Which way, that door or this door? All right, here we go. We're going to one of the most beautiful places on the planet. It's going to be a hell of an adventure. Come on! Hey, Miss Adafis, good morning from Oscarin Kyoto Golf Tango. We're going to try to go really far inland to visit our crevasse field now. It's about 150 kilometers from the airport, but hopefully the winds are on our side and we'll get to see our crevasse field and we'll be working on it over lunch. The crevasse field we're going to today was not there 30 or 40 years ago. We're not entirely sure why it's forming, but it definitely says things are changing. But that's sort of a goal is to figure out why the crevasses are forming 
and what it might mean about the stability of the ice sheet. I've been reporting on the global climate crisis for a long, long time in my career and the opportunity to see it firsthand. It was really beautiful to see, but then when you start to dig a little bit beneath the surface and look at the data, it's uh, pretty alarming. Okay, look how nice this bundle of rope is right now. It's going to be a mess by the end of the day. Now we go see if there's any surprises waiting on the short walk to the station. Hopefully there are none. Our challenge is that this station has not been making it through the winter because it uses too much battery. So the goal is to take a software update on this memory stick and put it into that station. So at each station we visit, Liam is helping the geological survey collect vital data about the condition of the ice sheet. There we go. I will now put the update on the station. It's updating the software. There's a little blue line going like this. Very slowly. Nothing goes fast. Yeah. It's all slow and deliberate. Why here? So I am Canadian. I did start looking into glaciers in the Canadian Arctic when I was in grad school, but I ended up moving to Copenhagen and studying the Greenland ice sheet because I feel like this is one of the epicenters of climate change. This is where the game is being played. What happens in Greenland will affect the world. There are crevasses here, and crevasses on the ice sheet are mighty dangerous. Lives have been lost. So in this location, I'm staying in the helicopter with pilot Adam and Anders, who is shooting this footage. I'll go out and I'll come back. So at this site, only Liam is allowed out for safety reasons and he must be tethered to the helicopter. The pole went down a little farther than it should have on that last one. We'll see what it is. Oh, well, there's uh, something that's very deep at that spot there. There's a level of change happening here that is very concerning crevasses that weren't there a couple of decades ago, and they're big, and there's a bunch of them. It's another place where you're getting a sign that something is wrong. It's another marker. So, when we arrived, everything was working fine, but now the ice temperature sensors are not working, and I don't know why. So I'm going to call our friendly technician, Jakob. Even in the Arctic, he has to call IT. From the air, you can see the beauty and the mystery in the deep scars that are the crevasses. They are a feature of ice sheets, but how deep they go, that's the guessing game. And they are an indication of something that is changing. What does it mean for the health of the ice sheet? All right, crevasses, let's talk about that because we're going to go see a bunch of crevasses. We're going to see some all very significant. So the crevasse field we're going to, it's about 100 kilometers inland from this point. So we're going to fly over 100 kilometers of ice sheet before we get there. We just noticed them when we were flying around the area a few years ago for a different project and we've started to dedicate more attention to them because one of the reasons they might be forming is if the ice sheet is sort of accelerating and sliding faster in the ocean and stretching itself out and that can sort of be the inland limit of that acceleration. So it's tearing it. Yeah, yeah the crevasses happen when the ice is flowing more than the ice can deform and so it fractures. In order to track the ice sheet's rate of fracture, Liam drills down and installs large poles for GPS. With that, he'll be able to see how far they have moved and the ice sheet's acceleration over a longer period of time. And they evaluate the rate at which the crevasses are produced and the ice sheet is deteriorating. All right, last pole of the day. There you go, that's the ice. Now, before we head back to Ilulisat, Liam and I stop here at the ice sheet's margin to see another indication of rapid climate change. So we can see rock here, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right there, it's ice. We're standing in something called the trim line, which is the newly exposed bedrock. So just a hundred years ago, the ice sheet margin would have actually been more than 10 kilometers west of us. And in the last century, it's retreated back, of course, accelerating in its rate, uh, up into the present margin there. So all around us, we're in the newly exposed rock. This ice sheet is really important. What happens here affects the rest of the world. This is ground zero for climate change in many respects. When you're a climate scientist and you spend more time thinking climate, talking climate, researching climate, uh, looking at the scenarios and what the future projects, I mean, 
those crystal balls that are the the global climate models i think then the cognitive dissidence starts to break down and that's when you can get you get way more invested and you can even get so caught up in it to the point of like climate grief where you you just feel so big and overwhelming so you're here studying this, you've been here for a while, and you know that getting the word out about climate change has been mm -hmm. hyper-politicized. Mm -hmm. uh, you're fighting this enormous, not just a misinformation campaign, but a disinformation campaign. How do you talk to people about climate when you know there are so many climate deniers out there? It's tough. Most people will acknowledge that climate change is happening, mm -hmm. and then the sticking point is whether or not we need to take action. Like the outright denial is a pretty hard position to take. There's very few people actually try to take it now. We have the Paris Agreement, which is nice in principle, but in practice, it's not screwing down our emissions uh, the way we, we need it to. I do take some comfort and some hope in things like litigate to mitigate with activist shareholders sort of- Expecting more from their companies. Expecting more from their companies and you know really holding them to account that they can't count on fossil fuel reserves in the ground as a bankable asset, for example. I also take some comfort and hope in things like divestment campaigns, um, consumer activism. So, you know, I see a lot of good grassroots potential, bottom up, which I think will really complement the top down Paris Agreement stuff. I travel all around the world trying to raise awareness yep. for this kind of stuff, but I travel all around the world in planes. Mm -hmm. and, it, and, then, and that's something that gets thrown back at me quite rightly. It is a challenge that we are climate scientists, but we use helicopters and high carbon activities to do our climate science. And it can be tough to justify that and rationalize that. So when it comes to flying, jet shaming is huge. And climate scientists, it's pretty easy to get haters being like, ah, you flew to that workshop and you wear plastic something or other. You're, you're a petro baby. Yeah. <laughs> and like, you do get those. You do get those. Is that a thing, petro baby? I just made that up. It's but a like, thing now. <laughs> But I have to live in a world where I feel like we can still do all of our activities, but hopefully be moving towards a smarter and more climate friendly way of doing those activities guided by some of the research we're doing. But I think it's fine to be critical and ask questions about if we're using the carbon footprint the best way possible, where are there alternatives and where can we decarbonize? The other thing I hear is that human innovation will figure it out. When you look at the paths forward, generally there's some sort of like techno savvy, low emissions pathway. Think of it as a Star Trek world where we all cooperate, we all share resources and yeah, we innovate our way out of it. And then on the other hand, we have a Mad Max type world where if we don't share resources, we don't cooperate, we just fight over everything. There is no common solution and the world just gets warmer and societies just start to uh, go at each other. Look, there's no question that climate change is affecting our world. And this visit to Greenland uh, helps to give me a first-hand perspective. And right now, Greenland's ice sheet is on average currently losing about 9,000 tons of ice per second, day in, day out, throughout the year. Greenland's ice alone is responsible for 17% of all global sea level rise. And for those still unsure about climate change and want to get into a debate about it, think about this. You can't negotiate the melting point of ice or the general physics of the greenhouse effect. Opinions aren't really the key there. The key is understanding the science. Greenland and her big sister Antarctica are poised to reshape our coastlines, whether we like it or not. We need to pay attention to them before it's too late.